Yeah, so there's a lot of organizations that come to the reservation every year, but not just in the reservation. Six or seven out of ten natives live in cities. So we have 36,000 native people live here in, in Portland, which is way bigger than any reservation in Oregon or Washington. Uh, so here we have the Native American Youth and Family Center. We have a great 9 through 12 high school academy. So I say come and get involved in our local urban Indian community uh, through the powwows, the programs. So if you want to go to a reservation, there's a, say on my reservation in South Dakota, there's an organization called uh, Tree of Life. They've been there for about eight years. They work with the tribe and they do uh, relief work, build houses, plant gardens. But they do it in relationship to the tribal council, the spiritual elders and leaders of the reservation. So they're always seeking permission, seeking welcome, seeking blessings, seeking input about how they do uh, what they believe God's called them to do. So. Probably all I'm saying in that is, if you want to go and get involved, then who do you know? Who, who are you in relationship with on those reservations? Because I didn't get a chance to talk about it today, the imperialization of the Great Commission. So I didn't talk about expansionism and territorialism and colonization in relationship to the Great Commission, because we in the West, they work, work under the mandate of God to go into all the world and preach the gospel, whether they want us there or not. And frankly, we don't even care if they want us there because we're under a biblical divine mandate. So we're going to go to reservations, we're going to go to neighborhoods because we're supposed to be soul winners uh, rather than a pro an indigenous protocol of welcome to the land. So where can we go where there's a welcome, an invitation to come? And that's a relational dynamic, not an empirical dynamic of colonization or expansion or gospel preaching. So, who do you know? If you don't know anybody, ask uh, Randy or I or sign up for our uh, mailing lists or whatever, because we're always doing stuff. So we'd be glad to make some introductions if we get to know you. But we're not going to make any recommendations if we don't know you. Because you might be one of those kind of evangelists. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, what I really like... Um, how you have a great understanding of how all people um, are made in the image of God. You, you mentioned it in your talk, you mentioned it now. And that's, um, that's an amazing thing. And I think that, um, I think that to kind of call out the church here, the past like, I don't know, 500,000 years, I think that we've done our um, Your boy down to a question, yeah, okay. Right? I think we've done our evangelism wrong, basically. Um, and that we have not, we've missed that point. I think I think that the church has, I'm going to get to my question. I think the church has great inroads of all people um, in that the, in the fact that we are made in the image of God. But we have not used that. I think, my question for you is that, do you think that this oppression that these missionaries have put on Native people and I think we do this all over as well. Do you think that this could be a, a, a misunderstanding? And um, because we don't know how to effectively share our faith with all people. I'm thinking about apologetics now, and, and, and just effectively defending and giving good reasons, and, and gently correcting those who don't agree. Do you think that this oppression could be a result of that simple fact? Uh, Randy has written this book called Living in Color, and he addresses in particular though, that question and other questions like that. So I'm going to have Randy uh, answer the question, and I'll add anything uh, to that. Uh, I have some, a couple of thoughts theologically about that. Uh, yes. That's my answer. <laughs> 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 he usually elaborates and says, hell yeah. <laughs> I actually want to skip back to the first question, um, and it relates a little bit uh, on secretism. Because it's always someone else's culture that we're trying to decide whether we should we cross a line or not. So you said, and the thing that people always say is, where do we draw the line, right? Well, the point is, is you don't draw the line. The people within that culture draw the line, because they understand what it means. So the amazing thing to me is how, uh, controlling the church has become after Acts uh, 17. In Acts 17, you know, they said, you know, uh, the, the church decided, uh, I'm sorry, Acts 15, the church decided, you know, here's four things 
that we want the Gentiles to do. Only four things. And they all had to do with temple worship. And, and that was it. And yet, since then, people have added to that list, you know, expedition. Like, well, if you're a Christian, you can't do this. If you can... What's amazing to me is that they trusted the Holy Spirit enough to for people to trust the Holy Spirit enough to decide where those lines are. And so uh, when people ask that question, you know, where do we draw the line? My answer is you don't draw the line. The people themselves, the indigenous people, whoever they are, they're the ones that end up drawing the line. So, um, so I hope that addresses that. Um, there's a whole lot, uh, we have a whole lot of theology, but we don't have a whole lot of theology about being human. Richard mentioned that, you know, the, we get our theology from up here and then to here. And I think theology needs to start from the ground and go into our hearts and then through filter through our minds. And that's where we find our humanity. And so uh, we need a renewal of the theology of humanity, what it means to be human with each other, all part of the human community. And if you understand shalom, shalom is the idea, and we have indigenous concepts of shalom all around the whole world with indigenous peoples. Um, shalom says that when uh, some of the community are at war and others at peace, and no one has shalom, when some of the community is hungry and others are eating well, there is no shalom. And so um, shalom has everything to do with us being human as well. And uh, this idea of justice and the justice conference is what hits the nail on the head. It's like, um, how do we actually make things right? <clears throat> so one of the things I struggled with is a reference about when I, after I became a follower of Jesus, then I had to choose to become a Calvinist or Armenian or whatever. <clears throat> if my goal is to get people to say the prayer to go to heaven, because they're going to go to hell if they don't, and, and I adopt a kind of Greek dualism or this binary worldview framework. It's either this and that. There's no, there's no, as missiologists would talk about, excluded middle where you can have honest conversation and dialogue. You have to be one or the other all the time. You can't be a Calvinist and a Wesley. You can't be this and that. You have to be one or the other. So I'm going to put together this big, long description. I'm a Calvinist and a Baptist. Because why can't I be? Like, where's the rules? Who writes those rules that create these rigid categories of definition, and then you're in one of them or you're in another one? So Rob Bell writes his book, and then John Piper writes his book. So I'm going to write a controversial book and have John Piper be my publicist. And I will sell a lot of books. So it's the so same kind of adversarial compartments that are reflective of that hermeneutic that I was getting at today. That, that binary dualism which um, forces you to have to choose all the time, but we do it in the name of orthodoxy. And then we have apologetics that we do. So my, this book that I wrote, actually I wrote this book 15, 16 years ago as an apologetic so white people would feel safe that we could be fully native. And I wrote it so that native people could embrace themselves as fully native and Christian. Because we used to hear, if you become a Christian, you have to choose. Be a Christian or be native. You can't be both. Now that sounds ridiculous, because I've never heard a white person say, what do I do about my whiteness? I'm a Christian. <laughs> but native people have said that a lot. And where does that come from? It comes from that flawed hermeneutic, which has a theological supposition as a foundation. We're saying, no, we're not bound by those arbitrary definitions and categories that somebody in Wheaton or Southwest Biblical Seminary or God forbid George Fox would say such things uh, and other places so like why do old dead white guys get to become the final authority of good orthodox theology if they were reformers then that implies reformation is a process and is an ongoing process it doesn't end at a point in time so we do reflection but that doesn't become the baseline by which we measure good theology. They, they, they work this stuff out in their day, in their time. Now, we are called to do the same thing, but you suffer because of a lack of the input of an indigenous worldview perspective. So you're still limited by your binary worldview constructs of modernity. But most of you in this room might say I'm a postmodern. I'm disillusioned. 
with the confidence that we have put in the, our capacity to completely understand all that there is to know about God. So we become epistemologically constipated. <laughs> and, and so in our trying to rescue theology from the cowboys, we just want to broaden the conversation, but I think we have a unique view uh, of history and the future as indigenous communities that the church desperately needs, particularly at this point in time and history. I don't have anything to do with your question, but <laughs> it sounded cool. When I uh, okay, uh, so I'm going to do this. You, and then you, and then you, and then you. Okay? You got four there. Yeah, I think you've well framed the hermeneutic dilemma that we're in. Uh, do you have, uh, in these competing hermeneutics that we have, suggestions as to a native, more native uh, interpretive lenses to develop? What, where, would you, where would you turn whitey to? <laughs> Uh, Randy has a book coming out in June that addresses these very issues on indigenous views of harmony or shalom, which are offering another hermeneutical framework, if you will, to consider these issues. Yeah, so it's called Shalom in the Community of Creation. And um, I would say the first lens is to start with land. So there's in uh, European theology, there's very uh, little theology of the land. So I mentioned in yesterday in our uh, panel that, you know, for most of the people who were listening there, it didn't matter if we were in Portland or it didn't matter if we were in Chicago or Boston. It wouldn't make any difference because you're grabbing concepts, theoretical concepts, and you're putting them in your mind. There's no theology of understanding what the land is about. Well, if you read the Bible, and Brueggemann actually says this in his book, Land, um, that uh, land is one of the central themes of the whole scripture from start to finish. And um, so we miss that. The Western people have missed that. Why? Well, it's a real good reason. In the age of expansion and colonialism during, uh, after the Enlightenment and Reformation, and, you know, it's like you can't have a good theology of land if you're going around taking everybody else's land. Right? So you missed out on that. So we have a theology of the land. Indigenous people have theologies of the land. And that would be a great place to start. So I would say, I would just have this conversation and say that, that the earth became alive with the life of God. And then when God wanted to bring living things to the surface, God said to the womb, whose time of birth had come. So the earth, the womb of the earth is pregnant with life. And God says to the earth, let the earth bring forth. So then comes cherry trees and palm trees and peach trees, etc. And all living plants. So then when God wants to create animals, God speaks to the earth and he says, let the earth produce, bring forth. So then we have platypuses and zebras and elephants whatever. And then when God wants to create God's self in human form, the mirror, the image of God's self, God creates human beings out of the dust of the earth. And so out of the womb of the earth come first man and first woman. And so first woman is just as much the mirror image of God's divine self as male man. And so if you say God is father, you want to be theologically sound, you must be able to say God is mother. And our earth is the mother. So at no point in time is the earth dependent upon us for its existence. At all points in time, human beings are entirely dependent on the one who nurtures us, provides us our air, the water, all the nourishment that we require to exist as organic beings. God provides for us through God's self in the earth, and that life brings forth stuff, so the earth is our mother. Now when people hear that, it's like, dude, that's so new age. It's like, I think it's old age, personally. That in recent years, a group of people, in their attempt to connect with spirituality beyond the institutional Western church, are looking for other things, they're connecting to the earth, and then we might say, okay, there's a new age movement, and tree huggers and all that kind of stuff. That's why everybody moves here to Oregon. And, uh, 
But it's, an, it's, a, it's another way of framing that conversation, as Randy talked about, that's just as theologically orthodox and biblical as any other framing you have heard. Because it's new to your ear, you say, I don't really have any categories for that kind of language, except that's liberal new age talk. Right? And we're saying it's not new age at all. It's old age. It's biblical. It goes all the way back to God revealing God's self in the earth. <laughs> Real quick, I'm just gonna, there's a lot more, but I think that was a great question. The second <laughs> theological lens that I would, or hermeneutical lens to look through, will be what is our relationship then to all the things around us, the creatures, the, the water, the earth. Um, because um, there's, you know, there's been this primarily a theology of domination and, then, and now stewardship. But even stewardship becomes a theology that um, is lacking in relationship. It's, it's still a utilitarian idea. What can I get out of it? Can, can I keep it going long enough so I can get the use out of it? That's not how you deal with your relationships with, I hope, your spouse, you know, or your friends. If it is, I think you need to re-examine your relationships. Well, we need to re-examine our relationship to the earth and all the creatures around us because the Bible is clearly clearly talks about those relationships. Um, so, um, you know, he was uh, quoting out of Genesis 2. So what happens when when God says, it's not good for man to be alone? What's the next thing that God does? Wrong. He creates the animals. Wow. Really? Yeah. <laughs> he creates the animals. And, and then and, and he says, name them, get to know them, understand them. And, and some people will say, well, that was just so, you know, uh, man could understand that everybody had a mate. And that, that, no, that's in there. I mean, that's, you can assume that if you want. But what it says is that there's a relatedness between human beings and all the creatures around us. And that we're related to each other. Um, and so only in that kind of lens can we understand, you know, to get beyond what we call stewardship and utilitarianism for the earth. We actually have a relationship, and we can go, and in my book, I do that, I go through all throughout the whole scriptures, New Testament, Old Testament, and talk about that relationship as part of what it's about. So just, there's two quick ornamental lenses. Okay, next. I, uh, I just uh, heard you guys mention before, I've heard it kind of mentioned before, the, the question of uh, the native perspective on immigration. And, and that how nice it would be if the Anglos kind of asked the people who were actually here first what they thought about immigration. So I'm just wondering, what do you guys think about immigration? Like what, what both sort of philosophically and concretely do you think the native experience brings to that whole question? Yeah, I'm, Richard will give you a joke, so I'm gonna tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's taking a joke right now. <laughs> good jokes. But um, uh, I'm writing a chapter right now for a book on uh, immigration. Um, and uh, basically, I've mentioned that uh, Native people, we have our, uh, what generally called the Harmony Way, but it's basically a Shalom ethic. In the Shalom ethic, in the Harmony Way ethic, was always hospitality and generosity. That's part of the main values that flow out of that system. And if you notice in all the earliest contexts, not all, but invariably, almost always, um, the Native people welcomed the settlers and explorers into their villages, fed them, looked after them, and it was only after abuses started that there became these kinds of animosities and wars. So that's a general way things happen. And so it, it seems very hypocritical then um, for the dominant culture that's taken over on this hospitality ethic, who claims to be Christian and has a hospitality ethic, to come in and say, for example, let's just look at our southern border. All of that land was stolen, right? Okay, and but we're saying you can't come in. So those people are actually probably more American than the Puritan founders who came here. So I think we need to look at uh, um, our relationship with different countries differently. Um, certainly in the Canada and uh, Mexico, um, those are just for, for us native people, those are arbitrary lines in the sand. They often split tribes up, one half in Mexico, one half in U.S one half in Canada, one half in the U.S. And so um, I think we have something to add to that conversation as well. Um, it's certainly not one of these, um, you know, the answer's not in building a wall and setting militia on the wall. 
Yeah, I don't have much. I just think though the the, the the Christians who talk about the Romans passage about the law authority, I think it's really misappropriated in that context. Like America's policies of immigration, <coughs> illegal immigration, all that kind of stuff. So that's one of those deals of what is the ethic. So how do we as Christ followers, do we house fugitives? What do we do? Or do we turn them into the police because we're bound by the law and the scripture says, and so when do you stand up against unjust laws or when do you submit to the laws of the land? So that's almost kind of a, a weird uh, um, paradox maybe, whatever that word is. And, um, but anyway, I agree with Rance. They're, they're just coming home to Arizona, to New Mexico. So we illegally annexed that land. We went to war, Texas, all of that. Uh, so they're just coming home. And I think we should all learn Spanish and it'll become the national second language of America. So Americans will become bicultural. Um, but that goes against our notions of identity and nationalism. Like we're Americans, damn it. They need to learn English because that's the Bible. <laughs> and it's the Constitution and it's all of that. But there's that weird myth of American nationalism and identity, but what if we had an identity of shalom? Uh, that would sort of rearrange our categories and our conversation, but it's not an easy, there's complex issues with jobs and healthcare and education and all that kind of stuff to be sure. So there was, I picked two more, so over here. I just feel like that's what you were a pastor and you didn't feel fulfilled because you were trying to be question and there are people say well I'm an American I'm part German Scott Irish French so I don't really have a culture um, but, but I think it's it's a way of thinking about tribalism as culture but not Americanism as culture so we think about culture in an ethnic context music dance clothing but as Americans if you've been to other parts of the world you can always spot Americans right they're loud, they're, they're <laughs> aggressive, they're, they're presumptuous, uh, everything revolves around them. They don't like to wait in lines, they like straight lines and order, and, and not just Americans, but, but that's a cultural phenomenon. Uh, it may not have anything to do with uh, the music and the dance part of it, but it is a culture. So, how, so then to think about those kinds of issues about identity and who do I embrace, because we have a lot of people who say, I'm part Indian. Uh, so we make jokes, like I would say, like I'm, I'm a Lakota Sioux Indian and I'm part white, but I can't prove it. <laughs> or my great-great-grandfather was a Welsh princess. <laughs> and I, I can't prove it. So it's all that everybody wants to be part Indian, right? And you know, if I ask you, you could probably all say, I think there's somebody said that one of my great great grandmas was Cherokee Princess, I'm pretty sure that's in my story. But that being said, I think to be able to love ourselves for who we are and to know who we are is really important. And so uh, I'll let Randy uh, talk to you a little bit more. Okay, well, I'm glad you studied anthropology. How long ago was that? Okay. So um, there are new categories coming out in anthropology. Um, uh, but most identities are socially constructed realities, right? You learned that. So, um, but they're real to us. They're real to societies, and people are, are just as real in groups as they are as individuals. So um, uh, we're going to have to rethink what that means. Um, we've had for a long time, and I think we're discarding that, sort of the American myth of what it means to be an American built on faulty ideas of, of uh, people who 
were, we would never recognize the Christians as we, if we were among them, but we look back and go, oh, Christian forefathers, you know. Um, and so it's all to build a myth. But really, the myth, the myth of America, we need to rebuild that myth, and that myth, myth is very much built on multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-racial kinds of peoples and experiences. And that's the new myth that we need to all begin to understand, because that is definitely the future of America. And so, um, and as we do that, anthropologists are beginning to redefine what identities mean. So um, now we have people who operate in multiple ide ethnic identities, right? And I'm sure probably a third of the people in this room could raise their hand if I asked about that. So it doesn't mean that, it used to, the ideas used to be that, well, one ethnicity is what I am, and that describes me and my purposes and my reactions in the world and interactions. And that's not true anymore for most of us. Most of us are at least biculturally or triculturally uh, citizens. And um, what do those identities mean? What does it mean to be uh, a, a Jewish, Japanese, Czechoslovakian? You know. Um, and and so, can we only choose one, or do we get to sort of hang on to and be around groups that identify as all the other ones? And so, we're going through a, a real—I don't want to say identity crisis. Um, but in, in a sense, it's a great opportunity that lies ahead of us to redefine what it means to be an American. And in a sense, it's nothing new, because the history and the stories are all there that support this whole myth of, of uh, what it means for America to be a multicultural, uh, uh, have multi-ethnic identities, multicultural identities. So uh, my wife is Caucasian. She's actually sitting back there. Uh, <coughs> And uh, we have four boys, so she uh, she used to be blonde haired, and uh, then she went to whatever color she wanted to be. Uh, now she's in lovely silver hair. And, uh, so we have had to learn as husband and wife to to navigate male female and the cultural issues. Now we have four boys. Two boys sort of favor me. Two boys sort of favor her. So one of our boys says, "I'm not white or Indian. I'm both." I'm the best of both worlds. So he self-identifies as a multicultural dude. And the other boys, one boy says, I'm never going to marry a white woman. And so my wife says, what about me? He says, that was dad's choice. <laughs> and so he's married a lovely Navajo girl. And uh, so, he, so what Randy's saying is like, that's a part of it. Now the problem for us is because our identity were established by blood quantum in the federal government. And you have to be so much in uh, percentage blood to be native for most of the tribes. Some tribes have to do it a little bit differently. So if my boys are now a quarter, and if they marry a non-Rosebud Sioux girl, then their children will no longer be Rosebud Sioux tribal members. So we could literally marry ourselves out of existence unless Rosebud Sioux boys and girls married each other. Um, but, but they're still native and identify as native. So anyway, I think what I totally agree with Randy saying is that in the year 2100, if what sociologists say is true, six or seven out of every ten Americans will be a person of color. Because the average uh, white family has 1.6 children per household today. The average family of color has three to five children per household. So when all those baby boomers croak, the largest generation in American history, that vacuum will be filled by people of color. And people of color have way more babies than Caucasian people. So then the challenges will be around 2100, us people of color, our challenge will be to get even because we can. <laughs> So we'll have more fire chiefs, mayors, governors, congressional leaders, senators, and we will uh, lobby them to pass favorable legislation to benefit us the way we perceive white people pass legislation to benefit them, but we will have the greater numbers. Now the white people will be tempted to protect what little we have left because we know how they are when they move into our neighborhoods. So, so those will be the challenges, but unless we have this shalom notion of what it means to be human, then, then this, this prejudice, this, this uh, fighting will go on and on, and I think it's followers of Jesus who understand shalom that can really speak into those forthcoming realities that we see played out in our, in our world today. So 
How am I preparing my sons and soon to be my grandchildren because they'll be alive in 2100 and I'll be dead. So how am I helping them to become a fully orbed human being? And that's what our salmon nation is all about, to become fully human and to learn how to have honorable discourse in the public setting versus the kind of adversarial combative discourse that usually takes place among Christians even because we want to control the definitions about syncretism and orthodoxy and infallibility and inerrancy and all of that. But, but until we can get past that to have good, honest discourse, we're going to be bound to still be pitted against each other about who's right and who's wrong. So Randy, and then we have one, the fourth question back here. And then, uh, so who, whoever's next, and then there, and then there, and then there. Yeah. So everybody probably knows these statistics, right? 2023, um, white children will begin to um, be the minority of children born in this country. In 2042, um, uh, white folks will be the minority and people of color will be the majority and never again will white folks ever be the majority in this country. Um, so, uh, and, and those continue to change and get closer. So I don't think it's 2100 that we're looking at new, the brave new world. I think it's more like 2050. It will be the concept. Uh, I'm sorry, 21. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said 2100. But the things start changing. They're, all, they're already changing. In four different states, there's already a majority minority population. Strange language. Majority minority population. Anyway. So, and, and I, um, so uh, I know some of us would like to say, you know, why can't we just think of each other as human beings? And we can, not you know, color. yeah. And, but we can't not see color. We can't be color blind because if you're color blind, it actually means you're blind uh, in the way that we're talking about. Because we are who we are. We have to learn to accept each other in our differences uh, rather than um, uh, exclude each other because of our differences. And and so we're seeing a little bit, I've got a, a book I'm working on right now, um, and right now the working title is um, um, Church Without Majority Culture Avoiding American Apartheid. And um, in that book, uh, I'm sort of laying out the possibilities. And what I see right now, we think of apartheid in South Africa, and some of us are old enough to follow all of that and understand what happened. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a uh, possible reality in America because if a majority culture, and it doesn't matter what that culture is, but if the majority culture in America being white holds on to all the positions of power and says, you know, it's important for us to, to maintain these things or else, whatever, you know, the scenario Richard projected, um, there's going to be problems. Power sharing is a problem um, with most people. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, and so, what, if you've been um, looking at politics in the age of Obama, um, what we've seen is a very much a reaction to, like, having the first black senator, you know, and now black president. Um, it's like, you know, all I hear about sometimes is, um, you know, taking our country back, you know. We get a little taste of some brown people who are getting positions of power, and everybody wants to take the country back somewhere. Well, yeah, we're not, we're, not, we're not going back. It's not, you know, and so as uh, Christians, um, which many of you here are, um, we need to speak prophetically into that. We need to challenge people to get beyond racism and understand um, what it means to accept each other in all our differences and, uh, and accept our commonality of being human. Was it Perry from Texas who was a candidate for a while, right? Yeah. So he was saying that we want to, we need to take America back to its Christian heritage, its Christian roots. So in my mind, I'm thinking, hell no! <laughs> I don't want that Christianity coming back to our people that put us in boarding schools and and brought genocide, and that's not the kind of return that I, I want for Native people. But anyway, so I don't want to, we don't want to presume on any time. So it is now 12:34. What time uh, should we stop? What time's the next deal? One? So we'll go a couple more questions because you might want to go and... What, what do you want to do? Let's talk about names. There's one. Is there one more question? Well, there's actually several. So um, over here. Oh, then, and then, so one, one there, and then one there, and then we're going to take a... Uh, one, yeah. <laughs> I was raised in a Cherokee Washington home, and I looked 
Caucasian, but I live that life of like, well, which one am I? And I embraced the gospel as a youth and brought that home and was like, don't talk about that here. And I didn't know where, what to do with my faith life. So I would love to hear what you first embraced about Jesus, about the gospel, because for now several, more than a decade, I've been trying to understand how can I relationally, but also through word that is significant to people who come from the indigenous life their whole life, convey that effectively. And, and just to hear what you embrace first and what you loved before you understood all these big words about the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> I you have an impressive vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a great, good question. So I'm going to suggest you, you, you read my book, which is my story. So how I went from being on the reservation as a boy, moving to a white town, becoming the goose that grew up with ducks, moving back to the reservation as a 18-year-old, uh, then back in the culture and the ceremonies and hitting white people and then to Alaska where I embrace the Christianity where I become a white guy again and then 14 years later I'm going back to the reservation reconnecting now as a believer with the culture so I've had this sort of schizophrenic experience uh, and, and sort of had to settle on some things as, as time went on so I encourage you to get my book in that because it's, it's whose influence how I met Randy and how I met Adrian, how I met Lloyd, how those guys helped me think through and then going back to the reservation and seeing the the, uh, the lack of, of impact of the gospel story among Native people and the colonization of Native people in the name of Christianization. Uh, so all those things began to come to life in me as, as the years went by. It's like something is wrong uh, and I can't figure it out. It's like the fish that's riding the camel's back. I said, something's not right here. And damn, I'm thirsty. <laughs> so just thinking that whole thing through. Uh, okay, the, the gentleman that was back here. Sorry. And then. Uh, so um, my question is, uh, you know, you're talking about how in uh, 2015 uh, the power is going to change, I mean, or at least there's going to be more, quite a bit more conflict, um, and we're all going to have to deal with that. Uh, white people, especially, we're going to feel that and the need to change. Um, how can we, even just beyond change, how can we become allies? Can you give us some suggestions on how we can become allies to, um, to already begin to stand on the front line of helping um, you know, society move into this new place? So one practical thing, I hang out with a group of men every Friday here in Portland. Some of the guys are meeting for 20 years. Half the guys are white, half the guys are black. <coughs> Uh, you've got uh, Charismatics, uh, Baptist, uh, Lutheran, Catholic, you've got 70 year old, you got 20 year olds, you got lawyers, blue collar workers, police officers, former gangbangers. But everybody's committed to, to help each other become a better human being, resulting in a better community. Everybody would say they're followers of Jesus, but we yell and fight and cuss and holler and drop F bombs and stand up. And then we go out to breakfast afterwards. <laughs> and over the years, these guys have been to each other's graduations, weddings. A bunch of guys just went to see Red Tail together. Some couples are going to get together and watch uh, Help together. Uh, so if you're not in relationship with your neighbor, if you don't know who your neighbor is, or if, you all, if you're white or black and you only hang around with people like you, uh, and you only have your kind of people in your home for dinner, for close personal uh, relationship, then nothing's going to change. So I think that the very practical thing is who is your neighbor that's different from you and how committed are you to love that neighbor, whoever they may be, uh, whether they be ideologically, socially, theologically, ethnically different. Uh, you follow the life of Jesus and hang out with everybody and befriended everybody. So can we get past our own ethnocentric prejudice and really love our neighbors. So I think if the world's going to be a better place, it's going to be because I have black friends and white friends. So I say the great gift of my life of hanging around with these cats is that I learned this in the last couple years that God is black. <laughs> I never knew God was black. It's not because I read the shack. It's because I, 
I get to hear my African American brothers telling their story of their struggle of what it means to be black all the time and to be followed and experience racism and prejudice and yet they maintain this, this vital faith in Jesus and I get to hear how they work out that faith in, in an all-white world and how they grew up here in Northeast Portland and what it was like when before gentrification when there was no white people around and yet they still live out this faith in Jesus so it's like I got to experience God revealing God's self as an African American which is a great gift to me which I would never have if I wasn't in relationship with these brothers for the last six years for me. So who are you in relationship with and how do you find and develop those kinds of relationships? Men and women, young and old, whatever color. Okay, uh, young lady. Yeah. Thank you for calling me. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, um, it strikes me that this conversation, what, what is unique about the perspective is the native perspective. And so it doesn't quite, it's not quite the same conversation as minority. I mean, that's an element of it, but you're also talking about the native perspective in the land. And I'm wondering whether there are um, examples in the world where there is the same dynamic being played out, whether Australia, New Zealand, I don't know, where there is more progress, more harmony, more wholeness, or is it pretty much everybody's in the same soup? Um, it just, so I would say same, same, but different. So yeah. we have the British in Kenya, among the Kikuyu, the Maasai, etc. The British among the Maori, the English in New Zealand, among the Aborigine, wherever the story went, the, the Dutch in Indonesia, etc. So the story is the same. Uh, the, the thing about America is that the colonists never went home. <laughs> so they went home in Kenya, eventually. They went home from Indonesia. But they never left. They made our home their home. So in terms of shalom and following Jesus, the native story is unique because Christianity was very Eurocentric and all this stuff I, I alluded to and talked about earlier. But we are part of a, a the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People Movement. And there's a chapter in, that in my book. You can just do wcgip.org, the World Christian Gathering of Indigenous People. <clears throat> so we had our eighth gathering in New Zealand. It happened in a different part of the world every couple of years. So as indigenous Christ followers, we're dealing with issues of justice, education, politics, economic development in the faith community. But when we first met in 96 in New Zealand, it was all about can we actually dance and still be Christian? Can we drum? Can we worship? So there's a whole 50 of us from North America went and we piled up all of our Eagle Feather fans and our moccasins and our drums so we dedicated them to the Lord just in case. <laughs> just in case um, spirits did sneak across on our ego Because we were all together convinced all the way. Yeah, some more, some less. Uh, and so they did. So did the Maori with their taihas and their hakas. And they're writing new hakas. Uh, they have this one in Ephesians chapter 6, of putting on the whole armor of God in the Maori haka. And the Aborigines were doing their traditional dance. So, so now some years later, we have become friends around the world in this sort of global relationship of helping each other. Some are farther along this way, some are farther along that way. So they would say we're farther along theologically. We would say they're much farther along politically and, uh, and socially in terms of how it works in their respective countries. So we're working to help us. So one more question back here, sir. <coughs> I've got a question about uh, a government bureaucracy called the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Mm -hmm. Is there any role for that anymore in this country? We call it bossing Indians around. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we should have been put under the State Department, and we still should be put under the State Department. Um, we're sovereign nations who are dealing with another nation, and that's how we deal with France and Germany and everyone else. Um, but instead, we're the only human species under the whole Department of the Interior, which be betrays how the United States actually thinks about Native Americans as a non-human species. So, um, yeah, the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, uh, needs a complete overhaul or it needs to disappear. Um, but the whole thing needs to, even a larger question is, 
should it even be under the Department of Interior? And the answer is no, it should be under the State Department. And then we could have a human-to-human -human relationship. So, um, I want to mention two things. Uh, one is that I think Sheila or Andy are going to give away some of our books. Is that right? In just a minute. And also our uh, Master of Arts and Ministry Leadership, which is uh, largely online, but we do have face-to-face -face components with it. Uh, it's an intercultural studies uh, concentration, soon to be turned into an intercultural studies master's degree. And it's, um, it came about with our um, organization called NAITS, North American Institute for Indigenous Theological Studies, which about 10 years ago, a bunch of us in the United States and Canada got together and said, um, we've got to start doing our own theology and talking about this. So we began to hold annual symposiums, we put together journals, and now we've started putting Native folk through graduate programs to school, and now we're developing with people like George Fox um, whole programs, and, uh, and more of those will develop in the future. So um, if you're interested in uh, looking at a master's uh, degree in intercultural studies, um, don't forget to, to take a look at this program. We accept non-indigenous people. We do um, uh, sort of have an extensive interview process um, also, though, to, to get in so that we make sure that everybody's uh, appropriate for this, this program. Anything else you want to say before we use? Yeah, uh, the, so, this is the what? Brochure. Yeah, so you have to sit on the table. So I would ask personally, what native, I'll just, ministries are you involved in supporting? What native ministries are you even aware of in your denomination, in your network, in your city? Um, and in what ways is what you're hearing stirring something in your own heart about getting involved? Because if you only hear this stuff, uh, that's not really justice or moving towards that. So, you have our information, we're available, uh, and we'll start you off at the introductory price for our consulting services. <laughs> trying to learn to be a good capitalist, too. <laughs> so, no, but in all honesty, that whole relational component, but I want to challenge you to, to take the initiative, the effort, to get to know what those are. And so Randy's here, and he and his wife Edith here, they have an organization called On Eagle's Wings. Eagle's Wings Ministry. Eagle's Wings Ministry. Did my wife raised her hand over there, so we're good. Thanks. <laughs> And uh, I've been doing some amazing work. So our organization is called Wachone National. So we do an annual powwow and family camp not far from here. So we have a one-day powwow. We build sweat lodges for prayer, for discipleship. Uh, we use all kinds of cultural expressions. And then Saturday, we have an all-day intertribal powwow that the public is invited to. And then as I referenced briefly, we're starting the Salmon Nation Internship Program here in Portland. It's a one-year internship for 20-somethings living together, six to ten interns living together under one roof, learning what it means to become fully human. Many of the things that we're talking about today. So it's an interfaith, multicultural, multi-ethnic learning experience in the spirit of Jesus. And so at the end of that year, what, what the hope would be uh, is that they would learn, by, to learn to increase their capacity to love deeply, serve generously, care sacrificially, and walk respectfully as a result of learning together in a diverse community through the lens of an indigenous worldview in the spirit of Jesus. So we will serve the local Native American community through the existing programs of the Native American Youth and Family Center, the Native American Rehabilitation Association, so our interns will become deeply immersed in the local Native American community. So again, how can we begin looking at biblical discipleship, if you will, in this kind of cultural framework. It's like, well, if you say interfaith, that means it's not Christian. That means it's interfaith as opposed to for, in many evangelical sort of ways of thinking. So we're saying we don't buy those categories. We're buying the category of being a human being and living out your faith in a way that loves your neighbor, uh, in a way that honors Christ and, and helps people become the best human beings that they can be. So we have a booth here of which only international will get our propaganda. And then we'll start asking you for money on a regular basis. <laughs> and uh, I just saw my wife just sitting in a chair, so Cap, what's the way of hand? That's my wife, Catherine. I'm just going to use my microphone voice.